Guys, cold open here to let you know that this episode is being released in support of Frankie's show, Gates of Heaven, at the Distillery Gallery in South Boston. Get to the reception July 23rd, 2022, and see the show all the way up until August 20th, 2022. The gallery's address is 516 East 2nd Street in South Boston. Please see their website for official hours and appointments. Thank you, guys. On to the show. Welcome to the Boston Art Podcast. I am Brian Huntress. I'm Theodora Earthworms. And this is the episode. Woo! <laughs> like 8, 8.30 at night. Are you recording already? I'm recording. All right. Here we go. So here's how we should hold it. we got to make sure we project nice and good. All right. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. How's it going? Good. good. We haven't talked to you in so long, I feel like. It's wonderful I to know. have you back on the show. Yeah, I don't think since maybe your opening oh, right. near, the I, near the ICA. Yeah, yeah, that was a wonderful time. Very weird, very weird event. <laughs> yeah, that was like, <laughs> that was like one of the first gallery openings I had been to since not since covid but like since omicron you know people kind of like went went back into their shells for a minute i don't even remember when what that fucking variant was also i forgot to tell you we're recording now if that's cool with you oh totally okay cool i just (laughs) realized i didn't tell you so (laughs) anyway Uh, and i was about to say something very revealing and embarrassing no i wasn't (laughs) but um um cool well yeah it's great to talk to you both as always yeah for sure i think you were one of the first people we interviewed where we hadn't met you before is that true theo maybe the first i think we talked about it during the interview too you're like i it's funny because we always talk about how like we're so happy and grateful that we've made all these connections through the podcast and stuff and blah 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 but you are you are literally uh the, like a, a connection we uh, you are a gift of this podcast to us oh well that's very kind yeah no <laughs> i was excited to see anybody wanting to do a podcast about art and yeah no i mean i i feel like community is really important and um yeah especially you know in such a competitive society i i i would yeah i'd i'd rather just you know know as many artists as possible i guess seriously (laughs) and i feel like you're like for this point in my life at this very very small junction right now over the past couple months it's i'm excited to talk to you especially because uh i feel like i've just been around so much sanitized conventional bullshit recently and if the listener doesn't know that you are absolutely not that you are well, like very you. off the beaten path. To be. Very <laughs> fucking bizarre. You caught us off guard the first time we interviewed you, where we knew, like, we knew that you made like some different stuff, but you definitely brought brought a, brought it to a whole different level. You know, especially like in terms of like your sculpture, your paintings, the Incontinence Project, your video art. You know, it's like all. I don't know. It's it's very. It's very real and authentic and just all around just fucked, you know, and like, especially in like this in a good way. And then the seaport and stuff and in in Boston right now, as you were saying, it's very competitive. It's a very weird art situation. Yeah, I mean, that was always kind of the thing I've, I mean, I went to... You know, in a, a four-year art college for undergrad, and um, you know, I mean, that's how I 
became like I was never the um, you know like the, the I was never the kid in high school who was like the kid who drew like I that was never me I was always just like bad at everything and you know all my friends were you know I mean none of the people I hung out with were never like the you know anyone's idea of success I mean some people some of the people I grew up with have done you know just fine you know but like I was never you know I, I feel like there's the kind of archetype of like someone who grows up to be an artist is someone who excelled at being creative when they were younger and I feel like yeah I've never I mean you know I don't I don't think of myself as like talented or skilled in any traditional way I think like I'm capable of like channeling certain things about myself and that is a type of like you know success but yeah I don't know I just I feel like I don't yeah I I guess sorry to go off on a tangent I just feel like a lot of people are competitive because yeah it's this I don't know like I I just I find competition really maybe I'm just bitter because I was always unathletic (laughs) so like so like yeah at this point I just feel like competitive anything yeah I just like I don't I definitely feel like there's like bad art that I'm like very critical of but I try not to like think about myself in terms of being better or worse Mm. than anybody or I just would rather just like you know I mean there are plenty of people it's like I don't even necessarily like their art but like I I don't know I have nothing it's just like okay you know in terms of Like, like growing up as somebody who is like good at art or is like competitive or like forming this kind of Identity. Like, do you find that that's kind of an over overplayed or kind of stupid kind of identity? Because, like, you see so – like, I feel like so many artists, especially people who are, you know, setting up for a show or something or promoting themselves, feel compelled. Like, feel like they have to create a story of themselves. Mm. Like, this arc about how they were, you know, this, like, exceptional young person and they had this vision at such a young age and – the actual, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think it's definitely always been popular, not just with creative people, but like any sort of public person. It's like this sort of self mythology, which um, is. Yeah, I don't know. I've always found that kind of, like, unappealing. Other than, like, you know, I mean, there are definitely, like, writers and people from the past who were into that. Interesting. But for myself, it's, it, I just, yeah, it, to me, it, like, success, success is, you know, like anything. It's like you can be really good at drawing or really good at athletics are really attractive and everyone wants to date you and you could be you know really good at academic stuff and you know I mean I know so many people who are you know they were when I was in elementary school were the best students and they now live just completely mediocre lives because like at the end of the day like no one really gives a fuck if you were a good student when you were 12 no (laughs) one cares i mean that you know and so the way that i don't know i feel like i i yeah i mean people who kind of play into that archetype are people who measure success in a way that I think is, like, false, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, if, 
yeah, if you're not like, I don't know, working toward something like, you know, that's interesting to other people, like, uh, yeah, I don't, it, creatively anyway, I don't know. I just, I feel like it doesn't matter. Like I, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, I, I find people who are just like failures in life more interesting. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because I guess what you're talking about, that metric of, like, doing well in school or meeting these, like, linear goals don't really apply to the creative field because as long as you are interesting, you could be making anything at any rate and it still works. You know what I mean? Like, it's more about being, not necessarily being unique, but just kind of having something that is attention-grabbing and interesting and authentic to however you see things it's more of a mouthpiece than it is like a goal to reach i guess and i really identify with that too because i i grew up as somebody who is just all around like stupid or or a fuck up you know i just grew up an idiot basically like i was not the smartest kid in the class i got bad grades my whole life and i was on failing sports teams you know never won anything you know, and that was fine. It's not like it like damaged me or something being like an idiot, but I really identify, I feel, I find that to be completely true that I grew up with so many people who were like academic wizards as kids that are, are fucking totally like fucked. Maybe even have bad lives. Yeah. I Maybe mean, because of that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, uh, an art school was like that too. Like, I, I think, I, I think having certain successes early in your life um, can condition you for like some pretty serious disappointment. Mm. You know, I mean, if you, you know win all these awards and make the honor roll in middle school. I mean, the world's much bigger than middle school. And uh, yeah, I, I just think like, I, I mean, my kind of vision for society is to move away from that competitive model because I feel like, you know, these people we're talking about who, end up le- leading unhappy lives. And when I when I talk about unhappy people, I don't mean to imply that I'm some happy person. But, you know, I mean, I feel some sense of tr- truth in what I do, and I'm thankful for that. I, I don't feel like I live, like, an inauthentic life. But, you know, I just, I, I, I kind of feel like competitive... Being competitive, it's just it, it it to me it kinda takes all the fun out of everything, especially creatively. I mean, I don't know. I guess like if I'm playing air hockey, I wanna win, <laughs> you know? Because that's the objective. But I don't feel like being an artist I mean, like so what is like the uh, the successful artist. You're in the Whitney Biennial. You're represented by a gallery in Manhattan that sells your work for upwards of fifty grand a piece. Like, okay, like okay, and then so, and I don't know. It's just like certain types of validation I find kind of like, um, like toxic. I I mean, mm. I work. My job, I work at a framer that, like, you know, does mostly stuff for galleries and museums and banks and hotels in Manhattan. And, you know, it's just like, it's just like, yeah, you you realize there's a lot of, like, similarities between what is selling for large sums of money and like i get that money is like makes you you know live more comfortably or whatever but i just feel like yeah i don't i i can't really ascribe to traditional ideas about you know success like i don't really i don't i don't really want to be 
famous at all. Like, I'm perfectly happy to only, you know, be in whatever city I'm living in, you know. I mean, that's, like, fine for me that's good enough I don't I don't I don't have these grandiose dreams it's also hard to have grandiose dreams when it always just feels like the world's gonna end at any minute <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah it really does so do you work for so the framer is it are they working directly with like an arts consulting art consultant group or is it um or is the frame shop an art like is it a art lending situation i mean it's it's basically we are just um you know we have a bunch of um clients i mean you know a lot of galleries i mean i'm not gonna like say right yeah, of course, yeah. which ones and uh, right now but you know we have a lot of yeah a lot of big galleries in manhattan that represent you know the most famous artists in America, which, which, I, I, and even saying that out loud, I feel like a fucking asshole for using those words because it's like I find that so unimpressive because I just, that's not why I care about art at all. You know, I mean, a lot of the stuff we frame is just like minimalist. It's like, oh, like a red square. And, like, Mm -hmm. I have nothing, like, a lot of art about a red square is perfectly good. But it's like, you know, 20 different artists make a red square and they all sell for 50 grand. And it's just like, eh, I don't, like, I just, I, I, uh, yeah. And I I don't mean to, like, target minimalism or anything because, like, I like a lot of minimalist art. (laughs) But, yeah, it's it, basically, yeah, we just have contracts, you know, an exhibit happens, we do all the framing, if if a client buys a piece from the gallery and they don't like the frame it's in, they'll send it to us to have it reframed, I mean. Mm. Big money um, shit, it sounds it, like. Yeah, and it's like, um, we make all our frames it's not like a typical frame shop where there's a hundred corner samples on the wall and then you pick one and it's you cut into like most frame shops use pre-finished molding that they buy and it's already painted and blah 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 Mm. and you they just cut it and join it i mean we you know make frames out of raw wood and then do all the finishing there and um so it's it's more yeah like more intensive that, more it's, custom. it's not like where like uh, yeah, it's not where like someone's grandparent will bring their like needle point um <laughs> unless you're like a rich person who or, lives like, their graduation photos from their grandson yeah like it's not <laughs> really like that it's more kind of like wholesale large volume stuff yeah fat mm-hmm. stacks do you find like <laughs> i feel like i have been something i've been reckoning with a lot lately because i've gotten kind of more involved with like random art like associations and art people in boston in a very different way in a really not diy way where i'm not really around people my age or people that are making similar work to me, but I'm finding myself, you know, adjacent to circles that may be making art like the ones your frame shop is working with, you know what I mean? Or shit that you'd see, you know, in these like corporate offices and stuff. And like, I feel like I've been kind of, my identity has been kind of fucked up recently because I find myself wondering at certain points absentmindedly if I if maybe I would be better off or happier if I tried to make the red square art you know what I mean I probably yeah you know, I mean I feel like I certain. I mean you if by happier you mean wealthier right. maybe but <laughs> maybe but I don't know that's it that's it I mean in terms of like 
I don't know. I don't... I like decorations, and I'm not... What I'm, I'm not... It, to me, it's not about whether or not art is decorative versus... Mm. It's, it's like, did the artist feel like they've actually uh, communicated something they had to communicate? You know, and mm. maybe that is a red square, and that's very valid. And um, it, but it's it's when you get into making art that you think is likely to sell. Well, then I mean I don't really then see the difference. I mean then you're just working in high end retail. Mm. I mean, that's all it really is. You know, you're making, I mean, you know, a lot of, I mean, I don't, a lot of art that sells for a lot of money are limited edition prints, um, which are fine, but it's all about this sort of like, you know, it's very product driven. Yeah. You know, it's not, um, yeah, it's, and I mean, for me, that is, I mean, it's th- similar to, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, certain things go through trends of making money, and that's fine. And I like all sorts of popular things that are, I guess, pretty mindless. But yeah, I mean, I just have no interest in, like, making those things and on a Mm. local level i don't have any interest in interacting with them but that doesn't mean i won't like listen to britney spears or something (laughs) just you know as an example like because i love all sorts of very popular things yeah i don't know Mm. it's it's complicated well i guess what it sounds like you're talking about more is art that has Maybe not conceptual art by, like, the definition of conceptual art, but art that has more of a concept rather than being maybe intended for just to be on a wall, you know? Yeah. I was, like, yeah. Yeah. I was, like, talking with my friend the other day and, like, recently, just in the last six or so months, I've kind of started to... Um, when it comes to like paintings and drawings and stuff, focus more on like avoiding any type of figurative or representational imagery. Hmm. Um, and because I, I feel like maybe I can channel something another part of my brain if I try to focus on that. Um, But, you know, I was talking to my friend the other day and they were just like, yeah, I, I, I would be a lot more likely to put the current stuff you've been making on my wall than your more figurative stuff because as much as I like your figurative work i it's almost all like type of stuff that make me feel kind of weird and bad (laughs) and i'm just like you know and i took that as a compliment it's like (laughs) i mean like not a compliment that they wouldn't want to hang my art on their wall but like yeah i mean I, i don't i don't Uh, Like, it's not, I don't care about making anyone feel, like, good. I only care about, like, communicating Mm. certain, like, feelings and needs that I have. And, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wonder, like, what the fuck that is. Because, like, you find that with music, too. Like, I find that in music a lot where I've played shows where and performed my music where... I have, like, actually, not even figuratively, like, cleared an entire room. Like, I've played to rooms where everybody literally left. Like, because I was playing. And it's just, like, that's fine because I don't make, like, amazing music. Like, I'm probably just pretty average, I guess. But I guess it's it's interesting because I 
I think, because I've compared the abstract art we were talking to in the beginning, and not to just make this the talk shit about conventional art episode, but I kind of compare it almost to, like, lo-fi beats, which I love. I love lo-fi beats. I like, you know, just kind of ambient background noise that makes you feel good. But something that I think unites everybody into liking that type of music is that it's just inoffensive. Like, it doesn't Mm. provide anything. Like, it doesn't raise any question or give any answer or address anything it just exists as like an 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 aesthetic alkaline like it's just it's just a just something that fills like a kind of like sound void you know and i feel like that's how how my art is a lot too where i because i do almost exclusively like probably only figurative stuff like Uh uh and representational art no, I, I mean, it, it's a kind of a stretch to call it figurative, but I think it was kind of accurate to say I'd make representational art only. And I, I find the same thing where it, it is a rare, it is a rare thing to find somebody that wants to hang it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, yeah, yeah I mean, I definitely think that any time you make figurative things that aren't like necessarily affirming I mean yeah I mean to me it kind of comes down to like do people want to come home like what are your sensibilities I feel like the average person doesn't want to come home and look on their wall and see anything other than something that makes them like feel good whereas i don't know i guess like complicated things make me feel good because when i see someone making art that like expresses something really difficult it makes me feel less alone in the world because i'm like oh okay i'm not the only person in a state of anguish Mm. and to me that makes me feel a lot better than um something that's kind of aesthetically comforting Mm. yeah Yeah. like i i love to hang things up that look like horrible (laughs) <laughs> like just because like sometimes it isn't even like I completely identify with the idea of recognizing complicated and emotional things and, and kind of relating to them. But sometimes I just like to hang something up that just looks fucking just awful. And it and it makes me feel good. Like it's funny that it's there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, and it's also like I feel like we're conditioned to uh, think certain things are good and certain things are bad but if i feel like if most people just like relax their brains they'll realize that their tastes are actually a lot more specific than they realized and that maybe something that everyone thinks is ugly is actually like not ugly to you you know i mean maybe you can find this really messy difficult thing actually like very um beautiful and affirming you know um i don't like i don't think yeah i mean we you know you know i mean we live in a really shallow you know, kind of like airbrushed society. And I feel like who's to really say what is and isn't ugly, you know, like it's, yeah, it's like, yeah. I mean, I like really childish type things like, you know, I like, I mean, some of my favorite art is like things people made at plaster fun time, (laughs) you know, that they gave me that like is covered with glitter and gunky, you know, glue. And you can see the hot glue hanging off, you know, like I love that. Yeah. It's like, okay, the person who made this is in it, you know? Yeah. It's an interesting thing too, to think about the idea of like curating a personal art collection and like the things that you'll keep in your home or in your like studio or on your person that really reflect the viewer. Like there is 
sort of the honesty and authenticity that can be strived for in just what you're willing to hang up and collect? Oh, totally. I mean, so often if I, like, go to someone, especially uh, an artist, but, uh, like, if I go to an artist's, like, house for the first time, yeah. or even their studio, studios and houses are different, because, like, I don't know, I feel like I'm the type of person, like, my, my, yeah, I have, like, a pretty similar sensibility no matter where I am, but some people aren't like that. Their mm-hmm. living space and their workspace are different, but I just feel like when you go to someone's house and you, like, see what they have hanging on their walls and you know, how their refrigerator is stocked and, uh, you know, (laughs) that's like as good a self portrait as you can get from them. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Could you tell us about the non-representational art that you've been making? Because I feel like I've known you to make, uh, draw, like, I feel like people or kind of scenes and situations. Yeah. What kind of shit have you been making recently? Um, well, mo- so I kind of think about it as like deconstructing image. Like, so, like, one example, I did a few paintings that, like, were kind of like big bird inspired but it was like you know you don't like there's no outline or shape of big bird i mean the colors that make up big bird are there and but it's it would be like if big bird exploded Mm. (laughs) but not violently it's almost like if you were to take a picture of Big Bird, but all the pixels were rearranged or something. I don't know. Mm, I'd fuck I with guess that. that's not a good description, but it's kind of like a, a like liminal representation. Yeah, like I still think of it. It's abstract in that there's no discernible image, but it's to me it's still representational because it's. Like, right now I'm working on a painting that I think of as, like, a, a, a portrait of, like, Dracula, like, Scooby-Doo-style Dracula, like, you know, animated, bright colors, you know, black cape with a red lining mm. type thing. And, you know, it's it's kind of like figuring, I'm trying to figure out what the, like, colors and sort of movements of a of a image is instead of like the actual like image. Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of what I've been trying to do. I mean, I've also been doing these like ink drawings with a brush that are more representational. Like I'll layer I like paint I like paint the same image on top of each other mm. like slight like over like veering off to one side so it almost looks like you ever see like the the, the covers of those old books anamorphs oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. like sh- yeah it'll like okay. show the character morphing into uh, an animal and it's like multiple overlapping images veering off it's like yeah i don't know i've just been trying to like be less literal in how i uh, try to like portray something i don't know what do you think is drawing you away from like do you feel like you feel limited by strict representation Yeah, I mean, I think a few things drew me away. I think the first thing is I began medically transitioning. I'm, you know, a trans woman, and I started medically transitioning about a year and a half ago, and I've experienced 
it's just so many changes just I mean, my appearance has changed, and that's what hormone therapy will do to you to some extent. But also, like, just, I mean, going from having, you know, testosterone as my dominant hormone and low estrogen levels to now having high estrogen levels and low testosterone, I mean, just my... Everything about me has changed. My, you know, my my impulses, my interests, my sexuality, the way I relate to other people, the way I relate to myself, the way I relate to my body, the way I relate to other people's body. I mean, just like every thing has like changed, and uh, and I. The, the ways that I had been doing things, I'm just like, all right, maybe that's that worked for me before, but like I'm I've changed and I want to find a voice that fits is more in line with who I am now and like work that i made before is totally still me i mean it's just the past me um and then another thing is i got really into this um painter um who's been dead for like you know almost 50 years um forest bess hmm. who was technically like, you know, an abstract expressionist. I mean, he was in that era. He showed in the uh, Betty Parsons gallery and that, you know, she represented, you know, Rothko and Pollock and all those right. people, all those grandiose machismo, like, <laughs> oh, I'm in touch with the, you know, anguish of anguish of mankind, blah, 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 bullshit. And, and far as best was just this like gay fisherman who lived in like rural Texas <laughs> and he made these really tiny abstract paintings based on like visions he would have and he was really eccentric um, and he had all these theories about like um, the hermaphrodite as this um like the like a physical hermaphrodite, you know, like having both sexual organs as being this sort of pinnacle human experience that would um, <clears throat> provide all of this sort of spiritual knowledge and he actually performed a surgery on himself oh, wow. where yeah so he he was a gay man um and he he performed this surgery um where he had basically at the base of his penis had an opening kind of, you know, like a vagina-like opening made underneath his penis so that he could be sexually penetrated there in a, you know, and, and all, I mean, you, you know, I'm not giving you the, like, he's so interesting and, um, <clears throat> He's so in, and yeah, you know, I would just be like, you know, like read about him because he's just like so fucking interesting. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes back to like what I was talking about earlier. It's like, you know, he's like a marginally famous painter of that era. I mean, he's mostly kind of like a cult 
figure and and but like to me he's like way more interesting than jackson pollock or mark rothko or uh you know any of those other dickheads um <laughs> yeah do you find <laughs> oh because sorry he's to just like you know i mean he like and he was just like a texas fisherman like he was completely outside of all of that and uh, the story that i read is like he came on to a man maybe when he was in the army and the guy you know i mean this was in the probably the 30s you know rich you know i mean it was much different than obviously and the person beat the shit out of him oh my God. Um, and then after that like every time he would close his eyes he would have these like visionary images and he would try to make paintings as <clears throat> accurately as possible depicting the image anyway i became really interested in him and i was like maybe i can pursue my visions in a more pure direct way than just you know thinking about color and how and forms rather than trying to like have a window into some i don't know i don't know it's some hard weird to spiritual <laughs> other yeah it's, yeah it's really interesting too to imagine like you know even like the queer or trans experience like kind of compared to this uh this artist's like you know, probably was a really dangerous body modification to kind of alter his, his genitals, you know what I mean? To, uh, yeah. to reach some kind I mean, of spiritual idea. Yeah, I think he did it in his house. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's fucking the, like, I mean, it's it was definitely, we've come a long way, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's good that, you know, if you want to... Ha- modify your body you don't have to you know drink a a fifth of whiskey and just go to town with a (laughs) dull knife yeah it's the you know it's it's good that there's i mean there's still a long way to go in terms of the acceptance of sort of the trans experience and how we all uh, interact with our bodies and you know i mean um yeah i mean it's yeah and, uh, anyway i just like i felt really kind of inspired um yeah i'm also yeah i really love like a lot of outsider art i've been getting into art different art than i used to be into another artist i'm really interested in who died i don't know like 10 years ago his name was yonel talpazan he is a romanian outsider artist um who like died penniless you know and he would sell his artwork on the streets but like he spent his whole life making artwork just about like ufos because he saw a ufo in romania when he was a child um and yeah i don't know i'm really uh, i'm i'm trying to like i don't know uh, academic academic art like that's the other side of mainstream art there's like commercial art and then there's academic Mm -hmm. art and I am trying to find something that has nothing to do with either or is like divorced from both in some way I don't know do you find oh oh, sorry (laughs) I was gonna say I find that really interesting too especially where you're saying it's like also sort of parallel to the kind of physical and emotional changes you've been experiencing with your transition like the Mm -hmm. idea of like almost kind of redefining your visual language and the way you're experiencing the rest of the world and that showing up in your art I think is a really cool parallel experience like that it's a kind of all-encompassing change yeah i mean it is i mean i 
my art has become a lot more, um, you know, it's still not like I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a way more tender person. I mean, I've always, my whole life, I've always wanted to be tender, but I always, I don't know. It just, it always made me feel so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And now I, um, I've said, I've, gained the ability to allow myself to be vulnerable because I'd rather be tender and vulnerable than like uh, an asshole and protected. I don't know. (laughs) That's interesting to think about that like experience parallel to the idea of kind of going from representational to more (laughs) abstracted art. Yeah. Like that vulnerability sounds like it's an asset to that transition. Oh, def. I mean, it's. I'm happy. You know, I. Yeah, I mean, I feel like. I mean, if there's like another life after this one, that would, I guess, be nice. But like, I personally don't have faith that there is, and so I want to make the best of this one, and I want you know my interpersonal connections to be yeah. ten- tender and not guarded and you know i want you know mm. and and that does involve you opening yourself up to hurt and heartbreak and all those things but i mean those are you know there's rewards there <clears throat> and I definitely being in denial about who i was i mean you know my personal trans experience involves my hormonal level, like testosterone. I think my, the levels of testosterone my body creates on its own do not work with what my brain needs. Mm. And so that's kind of where there's always been this disconnect and it felt very violent and disturbing. And I'm still a very disturbed person because how could you live in this world and not be, but like, I'm not, um, I'm not disturbed. My, my gender doesn't disturb me anymore. I feel at home in my body in ways that I never have. So <clears throat> that, yeah, I mean, it's affected my art like so, so much. Do you feel like there's a spiritual element to the art that you make? Like, I mean, like I know that you grew up, I know you grew up with, with religion and stuff and with all the Catholic shit and like talking about like accessing things beyond representation and, you know, in your, and in, in, in intellectually and kind of immaterially. But do you, I, I mean, despite the lack of faith and, and in a religious sense, do you feel a kind of spiritual connection to the things you're doing? I think now I do, but I think, uh, bef- so like, one thing I've like, pe- like I've always been against magic. Um, Interesting. But I'm not now. Huh. You know, it's like I've sort of magic never made sense to me. Magic um, in what way? Like I just it made me uncomfortable. I think like <clears throat> my sort of. Catholic superstition that was ingrained in me made it feel like and and now that I've I found that I've sort of opened myself up to my connection to the rest of the universe and that, that's another sort of tender vulnerability thing and I think, like, me opening myself up to that has been a spiritual experience. I mean, I feel a lot more... I mean, I'm... You know, I'm a person who's, like, struggled my whole life with mental illness. I mean, I was recently... 
And when I say recently, I mean like a week ago, diagnosed as bipolar. And I'm almost 34, you know, so I've like lived my whole life without this diagnosis. And I've, you know, I did a psychiatric hospitalization last year. And I've just like, I've definitely struggled. And, um, and I've never felt such a strong sense of love and connection to other people who struggle than I have recently. Um, Like, for example, um, I mean, I've never been a fan of her music, um, but like Naomi Judd, who a few months ago died by suicide, you know, she was in her 70s, but for the past decade few de- few decades she's like really struggled with like severe depression and you know she ended up um ending her life a few months ago and i just felt such a strong um sense of solidarity with making this painting actually where it was like basically like a sunset painting but it was multiple suns and um yeah it was a very making that painting and i considered it a portrait of her and and that's kind of what i mean in that like i still consider my art representational just in a different way you know i mean off, like in the normal sense, a, a portrait of multiple setting suns is not a portrait of anybody. But I mean, to me, it was, and it was like a very spiritual experience. Whereas, like the show <clears throat> that I'm about to have open um, on the 23rd all of the work in that show is about my Catholic upbringing, but like, I don't, there's all these references, there's all these religious references, but I don't consider any of that work remotely spiritual. I, I to me, it's like anti-spiritual. Hmm. That's, do you, are you comfortable talking about like the events and like your mindset leading up to your psychiatric stay and your kind of, evolution like with your new diagnosis yeah um so i actually i mean i have um yeah i've always had i've always i don't know i've always been that like not very trusting of like mental health professionals which i think has like not <clears throat> been in my favor, you know, because I feel like I probably, if I had been more open to certain things that I maybe could have like gotten better help sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, but basically I, um, <clears throat> I was definitely, like, I was, like, vaping uh, a pretty horrendous amount of, like, hash oil. Whoa. And, Last year? And, yeah. Yeah. And and then I ended up, um, I ended up getting assaulted. Oh, my and, God. And, yeah, sorry. I mean, and, and, and a few days after that happened... Um, that kind of like led me to have um, suicidal ideations. And the assault took place during a really manic period in which I was, you know, um, w- was engaging in high risk behavior. And right. that's not to say that, you know, um, people who do engage in high risk behavior do not 
you know, deserve to be assaulted, of course. Um, it just all happened to coincide. And it was, and so, I mean, that led up to, you know, I was, I wasn't feeling safe. And so I checked myself into the hospital. Um, and then because of that hospitalization, I have been following up with a psychiatrist and just recently I was like, describe, she's like, well, what is, you know, what does your life feel like? And I was just kind of describing, it's like, you know, I'm often highly energetic and then, you know, sometimes I feel like I can't stop talking and I, you know, and then, uh, and then there'll be periods where I can't get out of bed for three days. Mm. And she was like, Oh, it sounds like you're bipolar. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. Um, so I actually started, um, yeah, I mean, that's been, it makes sense. I mean, I don't know. I'm like, um, dealing with that diagnosis through like medication I guess but like that's been not yeah that's been like interesting but and not surprising but I think that relates to my new my more recent work and also my recent transition in the sense that like I think the reason why I had never been diagnosed with problems I've always had is because I just wasn't open about my struggles. Mm. And I feel like transitioning has definitely made me better at being open about my struggles and actually, like, you know, telling medical professionals that, like, this is what I'm dealing with, you know. It's so fucking difficult, too, especially, like, when you've had problems with authority or, like, abuse or different trauma like that. Like, the, the person who holds the key and holds the power and can fucking put you in a fucking home or get a bunch of EMTs to come restrain you. It's, like, so fucking hard to be honest with that person. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no... There's no incentive to be honest about anything. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, I mean, when you think about when you think about just like the way relationships are constructed, I mean, you know, most people placate each other cuz they don't want to upset someone. It's like, I don't know. And and yeah, you just, you know, you often yeah, I mean, there's no incentive to be honest. Honesty's like not really rewarded. I mean, um, yeah, you know, it's like you don't want to tell someone your problems because the problems you have, you see them stigmatized. I mean, oh yeah, people have no sympathy for mental illness. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've. Yeah, I mean, I've always been the type of person I, like, call in sick from jobs pretty regularly because of my mental health problems. And, like, you know, I mean, does not at my current job. They're actually really cool. But, like, other jobs in the past, it kind of gets to the point where it's like, all right, that's enough. And it's like, no, you don't understand. Yeah. I am a chronically ill person. <laughs> I yeah. just, it's not, you know, cancer. <laughs> um, it's something else that maybe you don't understand. And I'm sorry you don't understand, but that doesn't change the fact that this is like not only my lived experience, but like the lived experience of like a lot of people. Yeah. And I feel like that's a capitalist thing. I mean, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with competitiveness. It's just like you, you don't. Yeah. People are very unsympathetic to each other's struggles. You know, if you're going 
I mean, if you have a job and you can't come to work for whatever reason, I mean, how many how many of us have the experience of not being able to go to a job and then when you come back, you know, your coworkers say, "Oh, well, we were really fucked without you." Yeah. They don't give a, they don't give a shit how you're doing. They give a shit. You know, it's like oh, they're every, ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's all just about the that bootstrap type mentality. <clears throat> yeah, or the idea or the fear, I guess, maybe caused by your job or just by conditioning from other ones of if I have to call out, they're going to find someone who doesn't have to. Like, exactly. How, much, how far can I push it kind of thing? Yeah, it's like you could fucking die and your job would be listed online, <laughs> like, within the two days. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, and it's such a New England thing. I mean, it's probably a fucking everywhere thing, but I feel like I've grown up, and so many of us have grown up with this kind of, like, you know, like, 5 a.m., crack of dawn. Like, if your day started after 9 a.m., like, you're a you're a fucking loser. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I I'm mean, gonna work till I fucking die, and if you don't, go fuck yourself. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, like I feel like that, it's, it's kind of a working class thing. In a yeah. way where leisure or like, let, forget about mental health days. Like, just fucking relaxing for a minute uh-huh. is looked down on. Oh yeah, no, totally. And I'm mm-hmm. like, and I, I definitely like. I went to a Catholic. Like they used to threaten us with public school. Like, oh jeez. <laughs> Like, Southie High was supposed to be this, like, horrible school, which, of course, like, I know people who went there, and they, like, got a fine education, and, but it's like, they would just, like, they would fearmonger you and be, and be like, I remember my teacher always saying, if you don't get into a good school, you're going to be homeless in September. Oh that, was her, that was her go-to line. What you're going to be homeless in September. <gasps> I guess, like, she meant, like, you won't have a school to go to mm-hmm. unless it's Southie High, which, if you do go to Southie High, then that's a fucking school. Like, it's far from the end of the world. It's just <laughs> that none of us had gone to public schools, and our parents, you know, there was also a lot of racism, too. I mean, I went to Catholic school in South Boston, you know, yeah, yeah. so you know <laughs> That's what as types of people were going to that school. And so the threat of public schools was almost like the threat of being in a school with people of other races and socioeconomic backgrounds. I mean, they literally used it as a threat, and it was always just this threat of like you're gonna be this way or that way or you're you know and it was just like classist racist bullshit and that goes right back into you know what we're talking about yeah so when you were in catholic school how like do you remember your like theology lessons with any kind of like like nostalgia or fondness like how do you relate to the kind of fucking abrahamic like biblical shit oh i mean like i mean i I definitely don't think about it with nostalgia like i mean i i definitely have like aesthetic things that have rubbed off on me like i sometimes still sing Catholic hymns that we used to sing in church. Like yeah. when I'm just sitting there, you know, the way you would sing a Nirvana song. Cause it's like, <laughs> it's a song I know, right. you know? Um, and I definitely, now that I'm outside of it, I feel differently. Like I can go into a church now and be like, Oh, this is cool all this art and I love looking at the stations of the cross and all of this. But like when I was back, when I had to be there, I hated it, you know, like I wanted nothing to do with any of it. And I thought it all was like, you know, like I remember when I was like 16, 
we, my school took, I mean, like 16 or 17 of us from my high school went with a few teachers to Milan, Italy, because we had like a school there that we did exchanges with. Whoa. And we spent like every day touring churches. And I was like completely miserable. But like now, today, if someone was like, oh, we're going to go to Italy and tour a bunch of churches that I'd be like, Oh, that sounds like a blast. Right. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, but like when you were required to do it, you know, when you all you really wanted to be doing was like sitting at home like watching total request live or something. <laughs> um, you know yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I I definitely don't remember like yeah we had religion class every day it's just like, a handful. It, it was like it was just like math or science or history i find too not to like talk shit on religious people or something at all even though i'm kind of about to do that like <laughs> i find like learning about like biblical shit and religion so interesting unless it's from like an actual like faith perspective like if i'm if we're talking about it in a way like, yeah, and then God really did this. Like, it's, like, fucking awkward. And, like, makes me feel very horrible. But looking at it, like, in a mythology way, it is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, Catholic education definitely... <sighs> like, it was never... And I know that there are some... Like... Some Christians, I can't say which one's off the top of my head because I really don't know. But, like, Catholics were never, like, strict creationists. I mean, we learned about evolution in biology class. You know, it's not like we were taught. Like, we were taught the Adam and Eve story as a literary metaphor, you know. Interesting. but that's not but we were taught you know the miracles that Jesus performed were you know taught to us as if they really happened you know um it was kind of like a mixed bag i mean anything that could be proven scientifically we were taught right. but anything yeah i mean we were totally taught i mean we you know, I was raised to believe that, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and, you know, made a blind man see and turned one fish into fucking however many. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, we we were taught that was real. And, yeah, I don't know. I guess, like... I don't, I don't really care about whether or not someone's religious as long as they don't, like, try to tell me whatever, mm-hmm. you know, like, it's, it's like, you know, like, if someone tells me they're going to pray for me, like, you know, I don't like that. It's yeah. like, I don't want, go pray for someone who wants you to pray for them. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I just... I don't know, Catholic, yeah, it was just, it was, it was like a weird ass, it was like a weird time. I fucking believe it, I mean, you made a whole show about it, could you tell us uh, more about, like, the, the upcoming event, and, like, what kind of work we can expect to see in the, in the show, uh, upcoming? Yeah, it's all, so, the thing that I'm, like, the most excited about is the show is called Gate of Heaven, Mm. and the the parish I grew up in is Gate of Heaven, and it is, like, four blocks from the distillery gallery. That's awesome. Um, Wow. Yeah. So, like, when I... And I've... I didn't mean... Like, I didn't set out to make a a body of work... um, 
it's just like I I made a bunch of these crucifixion paintings that are gonna be in it. Um, like, nah, I think I sat at them like nine years ago or something. Wow. And and then, um, yeah, I've just like off and on. You know, I've always come back to religious references and like autobiographical type stuff. Like uh, there was, you know, a period of time where I was making a lot of work about my childhood and my grandmother because I spent, you know, a lot of time as a child with my father's mother and, um, and it all just, you know, I just started realizing that a lot of, like, yeah, it just, one day it was just like, oh shit, I've made a show's worth of shit that's all about my Catholic upbringing in mm. one way. Not so much my upbringing, I don't want to say my upbringing, because, like, my parents were, like, Catholic, and, like, my mother took me to church but i didn't grow up with like devoutly religious parents necessarily Mm. my mother would have moments of being devout off and on throughout my life i mean i would say my mother's an atheist now honestly but like growing up that wasn't the case and then my father was mostly just like i don't know he didn't really seem to have a strong opinion one way or another um but they definitely were you know always kind of like seemed pretty set on sending me to a catholic school and having me confirmed but like yeah the school i mean you know you spend all your time at school when you're a kid it's like your fucking full-time job Mm. so i mean you get sucked into whatever that is and so like in that sense yeah i would say the ongoing the theme of the show is the sort of tension between actual catholic teachings yeah and and the reality of things that actually go on you know i mean cuz you know i was i graduated middle school in hmm, 2002, 2003, you know, like, I, yeah, I mean, it was, like, a weird time, like, I was in seventh grade when, like, 9-11 happened, which, like, really um, made the kind of, like, provincial just people being, like, uh, not trusting of outsiders. I mean, it just made that so much more worse, as if it mm. could get any worse in South Boston. Um, you know, and then on top of, like, the <clears throat> the church sex abuse scandal. Yeah. I don't remember what year that was. That, like, I don't no, I think it really I, blew up in like the mid to late nineties. That initial Boston Globe story. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like Father Gogan or whatever the fuck that creep's name was. Yeah, gag, gag, and yeah. Oh yeah. Um, he um, yeah, and 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 also just like you know, I at the like. I mean, I I was in so much denial about so many things for as long as I can remember. I mean, that's just kind of what I associate Catholicism with is like my own denial, mm. you know, because I mean, I 
I couldn't like the fact that I it, it honestly shocks me now I mean at you know when I look back and I think like oh wow I'm openly bisexual I'm openly transgender I've been you know in public gay relationships you know I've dated men and women and other things in between that and all of these things that I have done publicly seemed so fucking impossible yeah. growing up. You know, it was just like, it seemed so impossible. And I was in so much denial. Yet I remember like as a child, mostly when I started like hitting puberty and it's like, okay, you know, I've always been attracted to girls. That's fine. That's what they want from me. But I'm like, oh, wait, but I'm attracted to boys, too. And rather than uh, trying to navigate that, it was just like, well, nope, that ain't acceptable. And just like fighting against that so hard and to be fighting against that all the while hearing about like you know just like the catholic church was like really just like a fucking marquis de sade novel you know i mean hmm. just like altar boys were being molested left and right and the church was covering it up and just that that yeah i mean i would say that is the theme of the show mm. you know just like a really complicated confusing childhood sensation mm. yeah it's like this like giant draconian power looming over you and fucking with your sense of self only to find out as you come of age that that massive power is like has this fucking death stench of rot kind of like <laughs> yeah no consuming I mean that's it a very inside. good description yeah so that's kind of what this show is about is that feeling of you know I. I mean, I feel like everyone's childhood obviously influences them, but I feel like I think a lot about my own childhood. Like, I think, and I feel like I, I have no desire to ever be a parent. You know, I'm fine having, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if I ended up, an aunt or something. I mean, I've been close with the kids of friends and that, you know, but like I, I never relate to children as an adult. I relate to children as a former child, you know, yeah. it's like, I, you know, when I'm like sitting there with children talking to them, I like, don't, I don't know. I kind of think it's more interesting to like let the child be a child and like talk to them on their level and not, I don't know. Like to me, that's like more inner cause more interesting. Also like, I like love a lot of things still that like aren't really considered for adults, you know, like I collect toys and, Pez dispensers and like you know I would like you know if I'm spending time with a little kid I'd rather like show them my action figures yeah. and and like play with the toys than like try to like teach them some fucking like how to you know how to like boil an egg I don't know <laughs> um I don't even like boiled eggs. I don't know why <laughs> okay. I said that. I just feel like I have like a weird memory of like an adult being like, we're going to learn how to cook today. We're going to boil an egg. And I was like four. And I just like wanted to like play with my toys. 
Right. It's like some horrible experience. Yeah, but like, <laughs> I don't know. So I just like think about how like weird and confused I always felt when I was a child. And like, I can't imagine there was a single child today that doesn't feel extremely confused. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's like, imagine like, I mean, like, yeah, imagine how fucked up being like a five year old must be right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can't even wrap my head around it. Yeah, there's a generation of little kids, too, that had to process a whole pandemic happening and parents being at home and masking and stuff, and they're still, like, learning to walk and talk. Yeah, their little brains are still sponges and shit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's just one of the many sort of... <laughs> yeah, it's fucking yeah, absolutely fucking crazy. Yeah. So to get back to your show a little bit more too, like what in 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 like a in a very literal sense, like what kind of work do you have in the show? Is it like a large series of paintings or is it kind of any sculptures or installation work? I'd love it's to hear about mostly, the, the specs. It's mostly paintings and drawings and there are several sculptures that in one way or another I made with my <clears throat> 3D pen oh, yeah. which I'm like really I remember we talked about it the oh, last yeah. time I'm really I feel guilty and I think I said this the last time but like I really love plastic um, like you know I just like all the toys I liked when I was little were plastic and I always, like, I don't know. I would, like, love to get, you know, a, a full 3D printer and just, like, design things and make things, like, that way. Mm. I don't know. I, I haven't. But, I mean, I would love to if I, like, I don't know. I mean, they're, like, cheaper now than they were a few years ago. So I'm mm. sure if I, like, set my mind to what I <laughs> could. And the rolls of filament are pretty inexpensive like all things considered um but yeah i just like love plastic like i collect you know i mean i'll literally be a family dollar and see a fucking toy from a tv show i've never even heard of and i'll just be like "Ooh, i like that i just want to like <laughs> hold it you know interesting um yeah, I don't know. I just I love little plastic figures like <laughs> more than anything, you know. And I and like Pez dispensers, and so that's that's kind of why I was like, oh, if I buy a three D pen, I can make my own things, and it's been kind of like that. And yeah, I and then there's I live in Salem now, but I'm moving back to Boston in September and I but there's this amazing thrift store in Salem which I think is called Witch City Thrift the reason I say I think it's called that is because it's been called like seven different things over the years gotcha. but it never took down any of its signs <laughs> so it's so on one side of the building it says Jerry's consignment on the other side it says Jerry's army navy and then on the other side it says which city consignment and then on the other side it says which city thrift so it's like it's like I don't know exactly uh, what they are calling themselves today <laughs> um but it's called something <laughs> and um they have a bunch of you know just like crucifixes there just like oh, wow. wall crucifixes so i like bought a few of those and like altered them so that like uh, the jesus figure i like made a new figure on top but i like maintained the original cross mm. um and then so that's kind of what the sculptures are, you know, and there's like, you know, other, there's like religious riff. Oh, and then there's one sculpture. This was kind of like a one-off 
so most of the show, which I'm excited about, um, is like 98% of the work in the show is available for free. Like, really? so there's going to, yeah, there's going to be, all the pieces will be numbered and then there's going to be a book at the gallery. And if you write your name next to a number and no one has, you can just take it and wow. no questions asked. And so, yeah, so I'm excited about that. What was the motivation was like, behind the the kind of self, like just the claiming of these artworks? Well, I kind of felt like, I don't know, it feels like cathartic to like give hmm. all this stuff away that is like so inspired by trauma. Hmm. And I don't, I don't really consider myself like a commercial artist. Like I... Like, I sell my artwork when I can, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But in this this specific body of art, and also just, like, you know, I I don't necessarily, in in, in the society we live in, I mean, I think people absolutely deserve to be paid for their labor, and art is often labor, whether or not we want it to be, you know, it often is. I mean, you spend time doing it. Um, but I'm also a firm believer in free art. You know, I am a, a communist. Hmm. I believe in, um, you know, I believe people should have original art and I'm happy to give my art away when I can. And mm-hmm. I'm always happy when people give me art. And I guess, like, yeah, I just, you know, I think, like, I don't know. I, I Yeah, I don't know. I just think sometimes people... People are intimidated by buying art, and sometimes if you just give it to them, it like takes that anxiety away or something. Um, if 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 you know, I mean, that's the goal for me. I don't know. I mean, also like, who the hell knows? I mean, maybe even though I maybe I'll have to pay people to take it. Uh, <laughs> you know, like you know, I mean, who the hell knows? Maybe people will be like, oh, this is for free. I don't want. I don't know. I mean, basically, it, it was just like an idea I had. It just felt like uh, I wanted to do something like anti-capitalist. I think that's and, fucking badass, and I think you're probably not going to have any cleanup. Yeah, that's true. After the mm-hmm. end of your show, it's probably all going to get claimed. I mean, that would be amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but the way I got onto that is... There are a few pieces in the show that fit into the body of work that, like, someone else already owns. And I've managed to, like, get all of those things, like, let the have the owners loan them to me. So there's, like... Interesting. Three or four pieces that, like, someone owns at their house that I now have. Oh, okay. Um, That's fucking awesome. And there's one, you know, and they're just going to be listed as, you know, not available. Um, But there is one sculpture, which is one of those that someone bought. And it's like a one-off. It was like my roommate had a white porcelain bust of the Virgin Mary and it fell. Actually, one of my cats knocked it over (laughs) and like it fell and like it took a huge chunk out of the side of her head. And I was like, oh, Tina, I'm so sorry. And she was basically just like, I got it for like $2 at a yard sale. I don't care. And I was like, oh, you don't care. Then do you care if I alter it? So I like altered that with the three D pen. So it's like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so it's like half, but I like left a lot of the original porcelain exposed. So it's like white 
porcelain mixed with, you know, 3D pen filament. Um, and so that's like another example of like the sculpture stuff. And then there's, I told you about that series of crucifixions I did. I think there's like 21 or 22 of those. And those are all done on like, I forget what size, but like, you know how you can buy like the, you know, if you're at an art store, you can buy the single pieces of paper that's already like a certain color. Yeah. 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 So I bought a bunch of those and I just did paintings on those. So the crucifixions are all done on like different colored pieces of paper. Mm. There's one, the largest piece in the show is this six by six foot acrylic painting, which is just like on a, six by six foot piece of unstretched canvas and that one's kind of like has the church like a pretty kind of like pretty accurate representation of what the the structure of the church um and that one that's the one that like on the website that's the main image that's like the large painting and then there's going to be one video loop playing and it's so a few years so the church that i grew up in like the school was like next to it and someone bought the school but the church is still there so a few years ago they tore the school down and I was so upset because I was like, oh, my God, because my plan for years was like when they tear the school down, I want to be there and I want to film it. But they kept changing the um, the date of when they were supposed to tear it down. So I lost track. And then one day I went online and I read that they tore it down and I was like, no, I missed it. I was so upset. But then I did a Google search and I, and it just so happened someone took a video of them tearing it down and posted it online. Wow. And it was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, thank God. And so that, the video, that video is just going to be playing on a loop. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I'm excited for that. And then, yeah, that's basically my work in the show. But then the other part of the show is the show is actually the kickoff performance of my band, The Incontinence Projects Tour. I so, saw the post for that. That's so exciting. Oh, shit. How far are you guys going? How many dates? only like five or six and it's only like a it's like a very small northeast hey tour. those northeast runs are really fun yeah um we're doing um three or four massachusetts like we're doing like you know we're doing cambridge we're doing the the distillery and then we're going to do one in cambridge one in worcester and then one in uh, somewhere in western mass is it northampton or something mm, and then we're doing providence places. rhode island and then we're doing the farthest one we're doing is like an hour outside of jersey city okay. oh wow yeah and yeah, we've been watching a lot of Sopranos lately, <laughs> and we were just kind of like, we we were just kind of like, fuck New York City. That's the obvious thing. Let's try, do a Jersey show. <laughs> so we just we <clears throat> we didn't even try to book one in New York, just because like sometimes New York just feels like so obvious that it's just like, oh, let's just fucking skip it. Who cares? <laughs> it fucking you know, sucks to travel to um, to and from. Yeah, let's just do some place like an hour, like in like some little Jersey suburb. Like who cares? Um, 
So yeah, we're excited for that. That's super funny. I feel like something that I've noticed as we've been interviewing more and more artists in Boston is that there's just this kind of subtle but persistent, like, fuck New York sentiment, which I, I kind of love that that's a recurring theme. <laughs> well, I love, I mean, I love New York. Like, I love, I haven't, I don't think I've been there since COVID started. Yeah. But, like, before COVID, I would, I would go to Brooklyn at least once every couple months just because I love, I love, you know, I love Brooklyn. New York I love, is a lot of fun. I like Brooklyn a lot more than Manhattan. Yeah. Um, I mean, Manhattan's like, I don't know. It's all right. I mean, there are parts. I love Harlem. Har- like, I love the houses in Harlem and just like walking you know, I love I love the houses in Brooklyn too. Um, the architecture is like a little different. Also, Brooklyn's like bigger than fucking all of Boston. I mean, to yeah. say like the houses in Brooklyn, I mean that can mean a thousand things. <laughs> I mean, but if you're in like Bed Stuy or Bushwick, there's like so many like amazing like front gates that like you never see get front gates like that anywhere in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, um, but no, I love new, but just like in terms of like creatively, it just, it's like New York is like so saturated with artists that yeah, I mean, of course, very interesting things do happen in New York, but I feel like, I don't know, I just find it more interesting to go to cities that aren't New York, L.A., or Chicago, mm-hmm. um, less so Chicago. I mean, I feel like Chicago is, like, cooler than New York or L.A., Um you know, but just like, yeah, the kind of big coastal cities are just sort of like, yeah, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> Over it's like I feel people go there because they want to live out their dream, and it's just like, I don't have that dream. <laughs> <laughs> right. That Boston, that South Boston dream. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm really excited for the show. That sounds super cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Also, Um, too, for the listener that doesn't know, this gallery, the distillery gallery, that's no small feat to fill that with a solo show. Yeah. So this is like, this is like, as far as I'm concerned, that's a pretty fucking big accomplishment on your part. So congratulations on this fucking awesome show. I'm really, I'm really excited, and it's definitely, you know, um, it's an amazing space for as long as I can remember that space has been, you know, artist run, supports artists, shows work that isn't necessarily sellable. Right. Um, isn't, tr- isn't, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been... I mean, there's, there used to be more spaces like that in Boston than there are now. I mean, but there's, there's not a lot of spaces in Boston to, to, um, for artists to show their work unless it's really sellable. I mean, it's not, yeah, yeah so I'm really excited, um, yeah, Shane, who runs the space now, I've been working with him. Um, yeah, he's really cool um, and supportive of, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like I was saying earlier, I mean, to me, like, community and mutual support are, you know, 
way more rewarding and interesting than competition. Right, and money and all this, like, bullshit commercial trash. Yeah, I mean, we have to figure out a way to eat, and that sucks, and, you know, I don't, you know, whatever, you know. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, art can, you know, still be, like... Yeah, I don't know. It's good. I'm excited. I'm excited to have the show so close to the kind of spot that inspired it. And yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited for the opportunity to Yeah, show that's the awesome. Work. <clears throat> Did you say you might have mentioned this earlier already, but was it an intentional selection, the fact that the gallery is so close by, or was that coincidental? <laughs> yeah, it was very intentional like that um i was like "Ah, this is where i want to do this and i was very thankful that they were on board yeah that's awesome how long has the planning for this been in the works nine years i would say holy shit wow yeah i mean Like I said, I didn't necessarily know it was going to be a show until maybe a few, maybe three years ago is when I started saying to myself, like, oh, this is actually a cohesive thing. Mm. And I was like, all right, I'm eventually going to propose this to someone and then i was like Mm. oh the distillery because it's literally in the same neighborhood it's the only art gallery in that part of south boston you know it's super industrial and, and residential combo yeah i mean yeah i mean it and the distillery is in like a weird a weird place because it's like you know if you walk it's like that it's right on the border of where south boston starts to become the waterfront Mm. oh yeah you're right you know it's like literally like if you walk a little bit in one direction you're on broadway but if you walk in the other direction you end up you know near the water and it's it's just like yeah i don't know and it's like but it's in a pretty residential neighborhood i mean it's not like you know most of boston's galleries are on newberry street or in the south end which a few with a few scattered here Mm -hmm. and there yeah something i'm curious to get your opinion on that me and theo have talked about and that i think about a long time uh, uh, for like uh, i think about a lot is the idea or the archetype of an art communicator or an arts communicator. And I feel like, because something that we run into a lot is that we meet people that make unbelievably interesting work or they've had very interesting storied lives, but they're not communicators and they cannot successfully convey those stories and they hate talking or they just, or maybe not that they can't tell the stories, but they just don't fucking want to. But then we meet people who have equally as interesting lives, or maybe maybe even not, or regardless of, of how they've lived, they are these fucking great speakers and talkers and writers and shit like that. And, like, I don't know. I feel like I kind of identified you. Maybe you don't identify this way, but I feel like you are in the group of people that are art communicators. Like, I feel like you can speak eloquently about what you're thinking and what you're feeling and you've done show reviews and write-ups and stuff and well uh, to me it's like i mean you know i i'm an i'm an artist and that's important to me but Mm. like my kind of dream and i don't know i my like long term hopefully not too long term like hopefully it happens sooner than later but like my kind of goal is to open a space and you know like I've done 
curating off and on and like film programming and like I'm really into finding artists like coming across artists um, that I think are really like pursuing their personal vision and don't have a connection to either commercial art or academia and I just feel like you know there are definitely lots of curators and gallerists who just show what they think they'll be able to sell and that's you know of course there's a place you know that's but I I don't know like I think yeah I mean I I I you know I'm like a I'm a kind of book book nerd. I mean, I read and, you know, I I like, you know, reading lots of, yeah. I'm a neurotic person. I think a lot and I just talk a lot and I am very interested in ideas. But, I mean, I certainly don't, I don't think one is superior to the other I think there are um, I think if you have nothing to say about your work um, that is great and sometimes like I mean the work work can just like speak for itself mm-hmm. um, the only people I I don't want to say I worry about them but the people that I feel um protective of are people who make amazing work but have no connection to any community that Mm. can um, appreciate it i mean some people are amazing artists and they don't they don't even know any other artists personally they're just like in their own they do it for themselves and i feel Mm. like I mean, yeah, I've come across several in my life. I mean, one of my favorite paintings that I own is there's this guy, Dennis Smith, and I haven't seen him in years. I don't, I mean, I don't know how old he is. I'm guessing he was in his 60s or 70s, uh, 10 years ago when I bought this painting. But it's like this koala bear painting. And I'll never forget, like, yeah, he just had all these little stretched canvases. He was right, like, in by the pit in Harvard Square. And he had all these different paintings of, like, animals and little scenes. Um, and, I, and I said to him, I'm like, how much is this painting? And he goes, well, how much do you want to give me for it? And I said, I was like, would you take 40? And he goes how about 35 (laughs) and I was just like I'm just like you're my favorite artist you know I don't know like I just feel like I don't know I just feel like I don't I don't mean to sound romantic about it or like oh I don't know it's I just feel like yeah I mean to me like someone like selling their art on a street corner is like just as good as like any gallery well there's something like kind of charming too about that lack of reverence it's like oh whatever you're gonna give me is fine kind of thinking yeah i mean yeah i i like it and i feel like yeah in terms of like Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky to be able to, like, but I, yeah, I mean, I feel like I can talk about my work, but I also feel like I just, like, go down rabbit holes of just, like, compulsively verbalizing and over-explaining things, and that, like, can be tiring, too. (laughs) I think that's fun. I like that. Well, I mean, that's the business that we're trying to be in in a lot of ways because I I found that 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 kind of over communication and really really going in depth about 
what you think and how you see things and fucking everything like that like has like an like an un like an like an un- indescribable value i feel like to oh, random totally. people that can listen to it like i yeah. guarantee there's somebody who will listen to this recording and like we feel like we're like we don't even know what we talked about <laughs> like i don't even know what the fuck i just said for the last two hours but somebody will listen to this and feel some kind of cultural enrichment yeah yeah well i hope i mean that's, right yeah <laughs> that's the idea at least <laughs> yeah i mean i would hate to think we're all just doing this for nothing but right. wasting our time. <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> i mean that's the that's the big problem is like to have this all not be for nothing (laughs) yeah it's fucking it's fucking dark because i have seen i I bring this up on the podcast so often but i have seen older older artists or even younger artists kind of go out their flame goes out or they pass away or they stop or something and their work i've seen people's legacies just turn into fucking dust and it's it's totally fucking dark and heartbreaking and makes me feel totally weird and yeah. terrified. Well, that goes back to community though. Like mm. if an artist who isn't famous dies, yeah. it's everyone who knew them's responsibility to salvage their work and make sure that if people want to access it, they can. I mean, that is like important and competitive society doesn't make space for that. But, you know, a community based society does, you know, (laughs) you know, so that's why. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. It's important, yeah, I think, I for know. that reason among many, for artists to know other artists. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's so... Imp- I don't know. I just feel like artists... Yeah. It's in our best interest to support each other to not and not compete with each other. <laughs> that is a really interesting point, because, like, that, like... Like, when communities are are supporting each other and lifting each other up, that kind of, like, idea of stomping somebody out or fucking erasing them or, or, I don't know, I feel like, like, erasure and people disappearing and people losing that spirit and and the culture losing them in turn is kind of, is, can only really happen when there is that, that kind of violence of competition in the market and in the economy. Yeah, I mean, it's only destructive. It really it's is. Never, it, never, it never makes things better. At least I can't think of an example of when being competitive really enriched the world. I mean, of course you have your people who will argue that in capitalism breeds innovation. It's like, no, it doesn't. Fucking <laughs> people breed and bring, you know, it's like... Mm. You know, I mean, you know, it's like innovation is not 10. It's like it's not coming out with a new version of the iPhone every single year. That's like only slightly better than like the last three. That's not innovation. That's like something else. Yeah. Um, That's marketing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Fuck America. (laughs) Yeah, oh yeah, no, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, holy shit. Well, we, we just uh, crushed out in uh, just about two hours here, guys. Holy shit. Cool. <laughs> well, yeah, it's um, always, thank you for having me back. Of, of course, course it's yeah. Like, you, like, I didn't expect, I didn't realize we'd be doing this this week, but I'm fucking so glad that you were on our, uh, our queue now. Uh, how long is the how long is your show going to be up? Because I know that it opens in the next like week or so. It opens July twenty third, okay. a week from Saturday, and then I got uh, those postcards are like around somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it so. I think it's July twenty third to August. 
16th or so. I don't know. Yeah. It's up for like three weeks, maybe. That's amazing. And you know what? We're gonna try to we're gonna try to make it to the opening and even maybe I'd like to even see it maybe uh, just in regular gallery hours so I can really spend some time with the show. But besides that, I would really love it maybe if when you set the show up, you could send us like video, like short videos and pictures or whatever shit that you would even want to. Because we would love to really hammer this shit out and post it around and try to get the word out for you with our with the podcast shit. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll post it all over the fucking place. One hundred percent. Yeah. No. It- I'm bringing all the work to the gallery Saturday at some point, and then hopefully, I mean, I spent some time looking at um, the, the exhibit that just came down. Um, I forget. I think it was called Seeking Enlightenment. I know the artist is Sophie Sam. Um, uh, so I would spend some time looking at that show, but also like, you know, re-familiarizing myself with the space. So I don't know. I feel like, I feel like the show will be installed fairly quickly. I have like some idea of how I, you know, and they're not... And I mean, they're basically just letting me do whatever I want. That's so sick. Like, they haven't really said to me that they think I should show it in one way or another. So that's, you know, I mean, (laughs) that's always nice. I've like, (laughs) I don't know. I'm definitely the type of like, I don't know. I've definitely like worked with curators before with my own work and been like, I don't want to do it that way, yeah. you know, and then you just kind of do it the way they want. Cause like they're the curator. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Well, shit. Yeah. Thank you once again for coming, uh, coming on the show and, and blessing the, the recording with, with your, with your, uh, experiences and your information. And we're gonna, we're gonna try to get our listeners out on the show or at least just fucking thinking about everything you had to say. Yeah. And maybe. Yeah. No, I mean, thanks again for letting me come back. It is a pleasure and I'm so glad you both are doing this project <clears throat> we're doing our best i think you're uh ep- this might be episode like 64 or 65 so we're fucking awesome. we're, we're we're fucking plugging along and, <laughs> and trying to where where our, our next goal is to hit 100 episodes yeah that would I feel mean, fucking no crazy back. <laughs> yeah right. yeah seriously so yeah, thank you because you've you've supported the show just by coming on it, and it's obviously amazing to to get this, you know, uh, be able to watch you from afar, kind of growing and getting a fucking a solo show at a fucking gallery like the Distillery. So that's oh, yeah. a fucking feat. No. That's amazing. And I, yeah, no, I mean, I've as much I've <clears throat> you know enjoyed getting to know the both of you as artists as much as you know just socially but no i have yeah. like yeah i'm yes boston boston's a shitty place to be but there are <laughs> at least plenty of like fun artists i hear that that's a, that's yeah. a, that's it a tr- could be worse there could <laughs> be no good artists yeah, that's true. that would fucking suck actually the friendships yeah, that make would the be scene. the most depressing yeah <laughs> Well, all right, Frankie, thank you so much. I think that's an amazing note to end on. We'll look out for your yeah. show, and we'll be posting about it. Awesome. Well, great talking to you both. Have a good night. You thank too. Thank you. Good night. Good Talk night. to you soon. Bye-bye. Right, bye. Boston Art Podcast is an independent DIY production by Brian Huntress and Theodora Earthworms. The information contained in this episode represents the views and opinions of the original creators or our guests and does not represent any institution, organization, or business. Find us on Instagram at Boston Art Podcast and tune in for a new episode every Friday. Thank you for listening.